Excellent. Well, great to have everyone along. Thank you so much for taking some time out tonight to, to join us. And um, we've been doing a series of the um, different messianic prophecies in the Bible. And isn't it wonderful that we have the, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, the Word of God, and they are prophetic. And that is to say that they speak of things not yet to come. And that God has put in our hands this amazing book that will actually foretell the future as well as forth telling the state of our own hearts and the state of the, the world and the state of God's plan and what he would want to achieve. And in a way, no other religion has that. Um, they might take a stab at it, they might take a guess at it, but it's wonderful that we can actually look back at all the things that were predicted, prophesied, um, and actually see, wow, actually God did fulfill that. He, he brought Messiah along and he has made provision. He has done this and has done that. And we can be encouraged that when we look at God's word, that he has a plan. And it's a wonderful thing. And, and I've been encouraged as we've been looking at the different studies, different messianic prophecies and so on. And I'm sure you have as well, just to consider how amazing it is that we have this, um, not just an amazing body of literature, you know, the poems and the writings and so on it, that the Bible is, but actually to have God's promises and his prophetic word and all the more so made clearer to us because we believe in Yeshua, in Jesus, and we actually um, have his promises made more certain now because Messiah has appeared and he's given his spirit and he's made it alive unto us. And so that's a little preamble there, just just really struck me as I was preparing as to how amazing this plan is and I hope tonight that we're going to see a little bit about that plan we're going to glimpse how amazing God's plan is tonight and the title as you can see there is that we're going to look at Isaiah 53 Isaiah 52 53 and there's a phrase in there which is prophetic as well and it is he will sprinkle many nations he will sprinkle many nations. And we're going to look at that and discover exactly what that means. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe that's something you know of. Or maybe it's a bit obscure and you think sprinkle. Is, is God going to give everyone a shower? I don't, I don't understand what, what's going on there. Well, we're going to have a look at that tonight. And the way we're going to approach the study tonight is I think it'd be useful to do a very wide angle, big picture first. Uh, and then zoom in at the specific verse there which you have is verse 52 sorry chapter 52 verse 15 that's the verse but we're going to have a, a macro view and then a micro view the big picture and then zoom in a little bit and that will help us to understand the background behind Isaiah 52 verse 15. So it's a book of Isaiah a messianic prophecy I want you to imagine yourself back in the time of Isaiah the prophet. This will be about the 8th century BC. Now at this time, um, the, the Jewish people, um, they'd risen to quite a lot of success actually, quite a lot of worldly success that everyone was quite wealthy in Israel, the, the people were prospering greatly, things were going well in a worldly sense. There was affluence, there was political stability generally at that time and uh, They'd had a, a time of peace for a while, so there was lots of trade coming into the land and, and things were going OK, but it was terrible spiritually. There was lots of apostasy going on. You know what it's like when you get lots of money, lots of wealth, actually things actually um, throw you off because you, you think oh, I'm, I'm doing OK, actually. But um, it's actually not the, the best thing because uh, these things can be a distraction, as we all know. And so because of that um, wealth and because of that money, um, People had slipped into pagan worship and they'd slipped into seeking other gods kind of as a compromise. They'd let their holiness slip and there was spiritual unfaithfulness in the land. And I could just imagine Isaiah the prophet looking out across the city and wondering just what had happened to the faith of the people. He may have been just so struck in his heart. Um, thinking about all the things that were happening. I mean, on the horizon towards the east, there were rumblings that the Assyrians might be coming in and, and uh, to take over. And they were quite a brutal people, quite violent and wicked and evil. 
And in order to stop them, to keep them in their tracks, they'd actually made a deal where they had to pay tribute to them. And if they gave them a little bit of money each month, then they wouldn't uh, be up in the face as much. And so what that actually meant is that there, were, there was heavy taxation in order to rustle up these funds to keep the enemy away. So that meant that the poor rural landowners, the farmers, the lowest sort of the poor people, they were just really, really outdone. And they had their taxes increased by uh, from a third to a half. And they were just broke and there was social injustice and it was terrible. And it was all because the people weren't seeking God. Because if they'd have sought God, then God would have protected them as he had done in other times. So there was growing wealth, there was social injustice, there was immorality, there was poverty. There were, it was just a terrible thing. And I can think about, you know, probably Isaiah just looked out across the city and just thought, gosh, I've got a yearning for God to bring salvation to these people. They're really lost. God's given us the Torah. He's given us his promises. He's given us things. But but what are people playing at? that They're not taking God seriously. It was it was a real mess. It was a very sad thing that had occurred in that time when Isaiah wrote the prophecy, Isaiah 53, and when his prophetic writings were put down, like I say, the 8th century BC. I wonder if you've ever considered what Isaiah's day job was also, <clears throat> because yes, he wrote the prophecies of the scriptures, but um, that wasn't all that he was doing. We get a clue about Isaiah's day job from Isaiah 6, because he was in the temple, if you remember, when he was called. And the glory of the Lord came and the doorpost of the temple shook. And he was probably a priest. So we have Isaiah the prophet and Isaiah the priest, the priest and prophet. And so he knew probably very much the commands that Moses had given the people. And he knew all about the word of God. The centrality of the Mosaic Covenant, the laws of God, and not just the gifts of God, but the expectation that God would lay on the people. He, he knew all about sin and holiness. He understood about blood and how the whole system operated, the sacrifices, the mechanics of that, what we would call substitutionary atonement. That is to say the animals died in the place of the people. So they were sacrificed, their blood was shed, that the people would be cleansed and continually being made right in God's presence by the blood of the animals. And blood was put everywhere on the um, altar and, and all sorts of things as we're going to have a look in a moment. But these are themes that Isaiah would have been very familiar with as a prophet, knowing God's word and as a priest, understanding perhaps from the inside the mechanics of the sacrificial system perhaps more than the ordinary people and a lot of the priests were corrupt in the day also when Isaiah lived and they were offering blemished animals and it, it, it was it was a sorry sight and so the themes that we consider in Isaiah 53 holiness sin the sacrifice the messiah the suffering servant these are themes that Isaiah would have been very familiar with. And I'm sure they would have been on his heart and he would have been praying and yearning for the people of Israel to see the light of God's ways once again. So I wonder if you could turn with me to Isaiah 53. It's um, sometimes called the gospel in the Old Testament, isn't it? Well, Isaiah 53. <clears throat> now, it's always tempting to pick a bit but I think what I might do is is read um read the majority of it if that's all right and we'll just start a little bit earlier from Isaiah 52 um 13 unless somebody else maybe wants to read is anyone that would want to read can I maybe pick on some Fiona would you would you be all right to read a, a passage for me would that be all right from uh, from Isaiah 52 sorry you want you want me to read from Isaiah 52? Yeah, would you be able to read for me? Um, if you start in Isaiah 52, verse 13. One second, and I shall we'll, bring that we'll up. Read through a little bit of Isaiah 53. And there's, there's so much packed in there. I mean, we could spend an entire year unpacking all the parts to it, but um, it might be nice just to hear the chapter and, um, you know, 
change of my voice, maybe if, if you're right with reading that, Fiona. Um, Isaiah 52, <laughs> please. Um, 13, and I don't know if you want to go to the end of chapter 53. That'd be wonderful, thanks. Okay. So, I, so what, my phone started ringing. What, <laughs> you would like me to read from? Uh, Isaiah 52, 52, verse, uh, what did I say? 15. 13. 13. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great, thanks. Okay, you just tell me when to stop. Okay. Verse 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He will be exalted and lifted up and will be very high. According as many were appalled at thee, so marred was his visage unlike that of any man and his form unlike that of the sons of men. So he shall startle... Who? Oh. I'm reading the JPS, I better change that. Because oh. <laughs> it doesn't say he that, will actually. sprinkle, it says he will... We will mention why there is a textual variant. We'll come there on. There yeah. is. All right. So I better change that back. He will... Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with the wicked, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring and prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand as the anguish of this as a result of the anguish of his soul. He will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he has poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Yes, thank you very much, Fiona. That was, it's, uh, it's an amazing passage, isn't it? And I think I was going to just say, just let's read a little bit, but I think actually it's really important to hear the whole of that passage read, um, especially in the context of, you know, this forum, you know, Chosen People Ministries and this Bible study tonight, because this is one of the main passages, if not the main passage in the Bible that Jewish people read and say, What's this doing in my Bible? Isn't this the New Testament? You know, if you read from that to a Jewish, the average, average Jewish person, they'll say, I don't read the New Testament to me. And actually, no, it's it's a Jewish scriptures. It's it's hey, it's your book. And um, it's it is the gospel in the Old Testament. Everything is so amazing in that passage. You have healing, you have salvation, you have justification, you have this servant who bears the sin and lifts the sin off and makes justification. 
In a sense, it's the gospel message, the good news, that this suffering servant will come. And of course, we've just painted that background picture of Isaiah in his day, yearning for there to be justice, yearning for there to be hope and yearning for there to be this restoration. And yet in this prophetic passage, we see these themes, don't we, very clearly. It's a big picture, the big picture of, of what Isaiah was experiencing in his day and how he, the, these passages really on God's heart come through him, even speaking to us today. And in Isaiah there, we, we see the Messiah, it's, it's clearly laid out, the arrival of the Messiah, the rejection of the Messiah, the death of the Messiah, and then also his resurrection, his coronation, it, it really does outline everything that the Messiah is and all that he will come to do. And it's right there, if you like, in the Old Testament, or as we like to say, it's in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh. It's God's prophecy of who he is and what he wants to achieve by this suffering servant. And we, we have this wonderful picture of a Messiah who is pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And it's this whole passage, which is the confession of all who believe in the Messiah, isn't it? And indeed, that might be Jewish people or it might be Gentiles. That God would actually redeem his people and redeem his people from political oppression, from spiritual waywardness. Ultimately, uh, he would bring his people in alignment with him throughout all generations. And of course, Isaiah would have understood this being a priest representing um, the people before God. And also a prophet representing God before the people. So it's a nice office that he has. His two offices, priest and prophet, the, the two, it's a two-way thing. And this is the big message of Isaiah. So that's the, the wide angle. I hope that's helped you to understand a little bit about the historical background, the cultural background of who Isaiah was and, and how he experienced those themes in his own prayer life in his own day, in his own culture at the time, and in his own um, messianic yearning. Now, let's zoom in specifically to Isaiah 52, verse 15, if you just want to have that open. Now, it reads, in most versions, it says, he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. That's ge the general rendering. But interesting that as Fiona began to read there from that JPS version, it, it, it deviated a little bit. And I want to unpack that with you tonight and so that we'll hopefully see a little bit why it might say that. But don't worry, it doesn't mean that the word of God is not trustworthy. If anything, it just gives us another layer of understanding so we can understand this. But let's zoom in now at that specific passage. We've seen this um, big message. Let's, let's have a look now specifically at what exactly that means. He will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. What they have not been told, they will see, and what they've not heard, they will understand. Well, we have a word here, don't we? Let's take it phrase by phrase. We have a word here, sprinkle many nations. I wonder what that brings up in your mind when you say when you hear that said sprinkle the nations anything in the in the scriptures that comes to mind probably as you think back different themes of different books um in the old testament in the early part in the middle of the bible or maybe the new testament what would sprinkling be well it's a word in hebrew which is natsa and in the old testament there's a very clear theme of exactly what sprinkling is and it, it, it can mean to scatter like a liquid in, in small drops. So you're scattering liquid with, in droplets, which is obvious meaning, isn't it? And it's usually linked to a ceremonial act. So let me give you some, some examples. There's some on the screen there. You might want to jot those down. But let's, in Leviticus 4, verse 6 reads, Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it into the tent of meeting. The priest is to dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest must then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar 
the fragrant incense that is before the Lord in the tent of meeting. So there's lots of blood being sprinkled. And the thing about blood is it would stain, wouldn't it? It marks it. There's something in the, the life is in the blood. This isn't a light thing. This is a very important thing, ceremonially, spiritually, but it represents life. There's life in the blood. So the blood would sanctify as it was sprinkled and consecrated on the different items in the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the, the Mishkan at, at, at the time there. And there are other instances mentioning in passing. We've got Exodus 29, 21. There's Leviticus 6, uh, 6. Uh, there's lots of Leviticus 8, verse 30. Um, Leviticus 16, Numbers 8, verse 7. Numbers 19, uh, Numbers 19, 21. Second Kings 9, verse 33. Isaiah 63, verse 3. And um, just do a word study and some of these will come up. But it does refer this word sprinkling generally of blood and it, it comes to mean in the sense of cleansing the blood makes expiation for the sin and to sprinkle with blood um that essentially means to be cleansed it's, it's linked with sacrifice and um removal of sin is this word sprinkling um, here's another one from Leviticus 14. It, it says actually that um, the priest will take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet string and a live bird. And what's he going to do with this strange bundle of things? Well, God says there's going to be some sprinkling. OK, what he's got to do is he's got to dip, dip them. So he's got this live bird. He's got to kind of dip it in some blood and he's got to sprinkle it. OK, sprinkle it um, on the house seven times, this blood. So, again, that was in Leviticus 14, 51. Uh, another ceremony there linked with something that the priest has to consecrate and do. And it's all got the idea of sprinkling. Um, also um, to do with um, being cleansed as well um, from diseases. And um, once you've been declared clean, um, for example, the hyssop would be dipped in there and, and, and dipped in water as well. And um, the scarlet string um, being, being sprinkled, um, so on and so forth. There's lots of examples of um, being cleansed from uh, spiritual ritual impurity um, and, and being sprinkled with blood. Or it might be water as well or references to being sprinkled with water as well or a mixture of the two. So it's definitely ceremonial. Again, Isaiah knows all about this and it comes up in this passage, doesn't it? Meaning cleansing. So we might look sometimes at the book of Leviticus and think, gosh, that's a bit strange. A, a bird and some hyssop and some wood. And they're all um, generally symbolic of, of being cleansed and purged from sin. Listen to what the book of Hebrews tells us about this. This is from Hebrews 9, 19. He says, when Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool and branches of hyssop. And what did he do? He sprinkled it on the scroll and all the people. And that's what you can see pictured there. So there's the commissioning of the tabernacle, the, the furniture, and the priest himself gets it sprinkled himself sprinkled. There's the scroll. The words of God are sprinkled. And then finally, the people are sprinkled. God gives his instruction, his commands and his cleansing for the, the things, cleansing for the words and then cleansing for the people as they're all sprinkled. That's Hebrews 9 verse 19. A little bit later, it says, in fact, the Torah requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And you might know it without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And that's to do with the sprinkling, isn't it? The application of that blood. And there's also water, as I was saying. Now, that's very important, isn't it? Uh, especially in this verse here that we've we've been thinking about he will sprinkle the many nations so what is this suffering servant going to do 
He's going to ceremonially cleanse, clean, sanctify, make right with himself people, nations. Just like the, the Israelites, they've sinned, they've got dirty, they've transgressed in their day-to-day -day life and what they've been doing. They come, they make a sacrifice, they're cleansed. Or they make a terrible sin and they have a, actually a big sacrifice on their behalf. I've done this terrible thing. And God has a sacrifice, a, a bull or a goat or something like that. And, and the cost of their sin is great. The value of the animal was great. I mean, a bull, that costs a lot of thousands, thousands of pounds today to buy a bull. You're talking the equivalent of a big tractor, a JCB. You know, it's a lot of money. And yet God says, yes, there's a value. Sin costs and redemption costs even more. We have redemption. We got it for free through Messiah Jesus. But it, it was very, very costly, nevertheless. So lots of things are sprinkled with blood. We see this whole idea in the, the, the theme here and sprinkled many nations. The, the, the word here is Goyim Rabim, the Goyim, the nations, many peoples. Now, wait a minute. Didn't God just give the Ten Commandments to the Jewish people? And didn't he just give the, the law and his expectations to one people group? And weren't the um, restrictions of the covenant to do with one geographical area named Israel? Wasn't it just one place, one people, one time? But wait now. What does this say? That a Jewish prophet will come, be raised up and actually make a way for all nations to come now and share in the covenantal blessings. It's enlarging the tent. So now all nations can come in and have fellowship with God who dwells in the tent. God of the tent who made himself, uh, manifested himself and his glory to the people. Now it enlarges his tent. This is a big message. And it's all to do with sprinkling. And now this other variant of the word sprinkle, because the Septuagint, which is the LXX. So it's a Greek translation of the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Bible, because a lot of people spoke Greek. So they translated the Hebrew text into the lingua franca of the day. So now we have two texts, really ancient texts. We've got the Hebrew and we've got the Greek. Same Greek as the New Testament. And um, that actually translates the word sprinkle here as to spring or to leap. Um, it, it, in a sense, many nations will marvel. And you might even have a footnote in your Bible. It might even have a little letter A or something. And then at the bottom, it'll say, or nations will marvel at him. Do you, do you perhaps see that in your Bible? Don't panic. It doesn't mean that the Bible is untrustworthy. <gasps> How can there be several meanings? Well, as they were translating the Bible, they, they understood the, the bigger picture of God and they sometimes rendered their meanings towards the fuller sense of what that meant. And this is a prophecy, so it's going to be flowing with meaning. And um, what they said was that um, it could mean spring or leap, just like you have the word sprinkle comes from spring. It sort of springs forth. So what that means is the suffering servant, he, in his message, is going to cause the nations to spring up in surprise. They're going to spring forth. They're going to marvel at this message. No longer is God going to keep his blessings in just one small area. Now the blessings go to all the nations. They can actually be invited in to participate of this big message. So. No wonder the nations are going to be going to spring up. They're going to rise up. They're going to uh, kind of be elevated in, in sudden reverential admiration at everything that's going to happen because they're going to be sprinkled. They're going to be cleansed. They're going to be raised up by the great priest, Yeshua himself, who has cleansed them, just like he cleansed the leper, cleanses you or I and all nations that come to him. He will sprinkle, sprinkle and cleanse. And we rise up, we spring up. So you see, actually, taken either way, it still makes sense, doesn't it? The, the passage still makes sense. Whether it's spring up or sprinkle makes sense. Most of the time, you know, textual critics or clever people, scholars, whatnot, 
they would go with the, the authorised version there. So that's why most of the time it's his translated as sprinkle. And that's what I've taken as the main meaning as, as sprinkle. Um, and that seems the preferable translation, really. But wow, think about that. I mean, imagine, I wonder whether Isaiah actually fully perceived that when he was penning this message as he was hearing God's voice. Mm, interesting. Now, the next phrase, we've looked at the sprinkling. Let's move on to the next phrase. And kings will shut their mouths because of him. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're going to be, they're going to be silenced, aren't they? They're going to be, uh, they're going to learn the facts of Messiah's humiliation, his sufferings, death, resurrection. They're going to understand this gospel message. And then the rulers, the top people, the kings, the emperors, key movers and shakers, they're going to be so amazed that they're going to just be silenced. They're used to giving um, speeches and leading and giving commands. And they're just going to be, wow, this is amazing. They're going to bow down before this suffering servant, the Messiah, and his message. Let me read a quote that I found from a commentary, which is useful at this time to have a think about this. It says, his gospel shall so prevail that all opposition shall be finally overcome and kings and potentates shall be overwhelmed with confusion and become speechless before the doctrine of his truth. When they hear these declared, they shall attentively consider them and the conviction of their truth shall be the consequence because what they're going to do these kings and leaders they're going to silently wonder at the significance of the suffering servant as they're sprinkled as they're cleansed as they get a revelation the scales falling off their eyes kings they're going to shut their mouths and marvel couple of things that are going to happen we see don't we going on to the next little couplet of this verse what they were not told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand <clears throat> they're going to understand it's going to be amazing two verbs they're going to see ra'a this is this phrase, this, the word see in the Hebrew Bible sometimes has a connotation of provision, like the Lord saw Abraham and he provided, the Lord saw Hagar and it was, provision was made. So they're going to see, and this word, let me unpack that, that Hebrew word, there's those funny little squiggles, that it's in the brackets, that's what it says, ra'a, that's the Hebrew for see. And what a see means in that sense is it means to see, to observe, to take into consideration. So the kings, they're going to take into consideration, they're going to observe, they're going to be alerted to the fact and they're going to have their eyes open, these kings. And what was not told is suddenly going to be told to them. And when they've seen, because they've been sprinkled, they're going to see. And then what's going to happen? This next word they will understand. So this is this Hebrew word been. They're going to diligently consider, they're going to discern, get understanding or get instruction. They're going to actually be instructed by this revelation. They're going to be steered and guided by what they've seen. They're going to take into consideration this big message that this gospel of God through the suffering servant is going to be so revolutionary that even it's going to influence the high echelons of society, the kings at the top. This gospel message, which has been so long hidden and concealed, is now revealed. And this is what Romans talks about. And Paul in the New Testament writes about the, the mystery, he calls it the mystery of the gospel. But not a mystery that's unknowable. No, it's like a secret code that's been locked up. And all of a sudden the key has come and it's been unlocked and revealed. The mystery is now made known to the Gentiles, to the leaders, to the rulers, to the whole world. That God has a redemptive plan, not just for one people group, but for all 
who had joined themselves to Israel and come under that banner of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, receiving his salvation and uh, and come in to the to the family, as it were, come enter into the blessings of the covenants and share with Israel. Amazing. I mean, we, we're unworthy. I'm I'm a Gentile myself. You know, but everything about my faith is Jewish because although I'm a Gentile. I worship the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I read the Jewish scriptures. I, uh, you know, worship the Jewish saviour. I'm drawn nearer to God um, because of Jesus, of Yeshua. And I've forsaken idolatry of, of the pagan things in, of the nations. I've, drawn, I've been drawn to believe in one God. It's monotheism. It's all Jewish. Everything's Jewish about my faith apart from me. And you can say that to a Jewish person, you know, if, you're, if you have a Jewish friend, you can say, hey, actually, I believe in the Tanakh. The Bible and, and I believe in in all of these things, but I'm not Jewish, but everything about my faith is. Anyway, the gospel message, wonderful. We'll go on and on about this. But I wonder if in the time of Isaiah, he would have thought, Oh, I wish the people in my generation would see this as he gazed out across the city. He would have seen the, the poverty and the distress and the ruin. And the way people were running after other gods and, and not taking temple religion seriously and not listening to the word of God. And, and he would be crying out. I mean, the first 60 chapters or thereabouts of Isaiah, or is it 40 chapters? The first book, two thirds of the book is, is all judgment, judgment on the nations, judgment on the people. It's only the last 26 or 27 chapters there, which are a message of hope. And slap bang in the middle of those last chapters of, of Isaiah is Isaiah 53. It's almost like the central theme of hope. And that is what he wanted to bring to his people at the time. And this has been pointing forward to Messiah Jesus for all this time and actually um, is, is a light even to today. And what was the best response? The best response to the big message is to believe the report. And that's what Isaiah 53 one says. Who has believed the message who's believed the report it's so amazing and this is the call this is the response god called isaiah to be a priest and a prophet and god shows isaiah the portrait of the true priest and prophet yeshua himself and now because of yeshua god has called kings and prophets and important people to the cause of the suffering servant himself and actually, God has called you as a priest because your prayers are valuable. And what you say in that quiet place, the prayer closet before God is of immense worth to the father and is very important. And uh, how you hear God speaking to you and what, what happens in your life. You're a priest and you can be a prophet to the people around you, speaking God's truth and affirming the word of God to those that you love and those that you desire to be saved. And this is the response of the best message, the, the big message, the, the big plan that God has sprinkled the nations and shut the mouths of kings because they're in awe and wonder, springing up, leaping up, because now what they were not told, they will see and what they've not heard, they will understand. Look at this from first Peter. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. I bet that's what Isaiah did, you know. He searched the scriptures, he prayed, and he, oh, you know, and God gave him this wonderful vision. And the truth is the suffering servant is still an amazing revelation, I think, of my own conversion from just being brought up in an atheist home, really not really kind of any religion uh, as such or any understanding of the good news. And then there's a, about a 16 year old boy in school, a teenager, just kind of just an unfolding of various sovereign events where God led me to different people and different situations. And I can say my eyes were opened and suddenly I perceive, wow, this is amazing. And maybe you've had a similar experience. And this is so amazing because I'm a Gentile. I don't deserve this amazing stuff that God had reserved just for one people group. But this is what this passage says. Now the message goes out to many nations. And so the best response is to believe the report. And this is what these people have done. 
you know any of these? Or maybe these names are familiar. I don't know. There's quite a lot on the screen there. I appreciate that. Here we have a list, probably a sample list, of various kings who throughout history have professed to have been converted and to understand the gospel. So we've got just reading a few off here. We've got um, Clovis, the first king of the Franks. We've got um, Redwald of East Anglia. Uh, who else? Edwin of Northumbria. Um, uh, there's one called Boris somewhere. King Boris. I forget where it is now. Uh, there's people in, in Wessex, people in Madagascar, people in Tongo, all sorts of people. You know, you name it. Armenia. All sorts of places. And these people, these kings. Leaders and rulers came to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah and their kingdoms were completely changed around and revolutionized through revival and understanding of this message. For example, I don't know if you've ever met, uh, noticed this guy before, I've, I've never heard of Pamar the second before, but Pamar, if that's how it's said, I don't know, um, he was actually, um, he, he ruled um, the dates there and um, he believed and he, he was actually in the country of um, his French Polynesia around there, really beautiful islands, you know, those typical desert islands with palm trees and white sands, you know, the places we're all going to jet off to now in our holidays, you know, those wonderful places. Well, this is where this guy was, was a ruler and a leader. And he thought, oh, no, I've fallen out of favour with the king Oro, the god Oro, who he believed and worshipped as, as the king of the god of the island. And um, there was a missionary there, and his name was Henry Knott. And he began speaking to um, King Pomer, and he actually witnessed to him the gospel. And um, this leader, this king, began to pay more careful attention to the God of the Bible. He got hold of a Bible and to the Christians and the missionaries there. And on the 16th of May, 1819, he was baptised and helped along the way by English missionaries. Because he'd heard the story and he'd given his life to God in the fulfilment of this prophecy. Look, here's another one. Isaiah says about the servant. He says the chosen servant, this suffering servant from Isaiah my chosen one in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. In his law, the islands will put their hope. And this was an island. I think it might be Tahiti, if I remember, where, where he was the, the king. And there are many others. Great Britain is an island. Um, there are many other places around the world that you can think of. The distant islands thousands of miles away from the Middle East and from Israel, that set of land where God places uh, his, his temple and his eyes are focused. And that's the land, his covenant land, and his, uh, the place where he chooses to, to be in his Jewish people. But yet even other nations too can one day come in. And that's the fulfillment of Isaiah 52 there that we've been looking at. It, they will be sprinkled, they'll be cleansed. What they've not seen, they'll be able to see and gain understanding. And uh, I'm sure there are many other leaders, kings, politicians and men and women of influence in all sectors of society that have been affected by this gospel message. You see, Yeshua, Jesus, he is actually the mediator of a better covenant. This better covenant the book of Hebrews speaks of. No more calves bulls goats calves bulls goats goats bulls calves pigeons and doves and goats and lots of blood being offered by um priests who themselves needed cleansing now the true priest yeshua has made a sacrifice and atonement for all people that all people can come to this wonderful message and be made right and become god's sons and daughters and all ultimately be saved and have him as their king and of course, not only does it refer to the nations, but it kind of goes full cycle back round to Israel. You see, the gospel began in the book of Acts, as we read in the Bible, amongst the Jewish people. And then it spilled over to Gentiles, didn't it? The God fear is Cornelius and the others. And then we hear of churches in Rome, in Corinth, in all kinds of places in the, the empires and going out and out and out to all the nations. 
But I believe that we're on the cusp of seeing the gospel returning with force and, and power back to God's chosen people back to Israel too, that though they might have had their minds blinded for a time, that the full number of the Gentiles might come in, now Israel is, is being sprink, sprinkled and cleansed. How many rabbis believe secretly? How many messianic congregations growing in Israel? How the spirit of God is moving, saving, redeeming, cleansing, and restoring families in reconciliation in the land of Israel. You see, friends, I believe this is happening more and more. We're seeing that the Lord is turning his heart and mind to, to restoring Israel. And does that mean the time of the Gentiles is drawn to a close? Not sure. Make your own conclusions, but certainly seems to be going that way. But uh, certainly God will bring that message back to Israel again. And uh, he will establish the fact that he is the better mediator. The, the best mediator, the best response is to believe the big message that God has a big plan for the nations. The kings, uh, having been ceremonially sprinkled, can now enter into the, that place of deeper fellowship with him. I just want to pray to close, actually, and uh, I encourage you to read that chapter, Isaiah 53. Maybe spend some time just picking out some phrases and, and praying over them and asking God to to show you um, his, the meaning of these and to impart the depth of them to your own hearts. And you can pray for the Jewish people. You can pray for our own island of Great Britain and the islands and, and pray for our own nation. And uh, maybe just think about this a bit more depth. And I hope it's been useful and helpful to really consider this amazing plan of sprinkling that the suffering servant would do. But may I just close with... Um, it's all in the theme, the same theme, the, the ending words from the book of Romans, which you may know chapters 9, 10 and 11 speak about Israel to Gentiles. If you perhaps don't know that, read chapters 9, 10 and 11. Wow, God has a plan for Israel and the Gentiles too. But let me read this end blessing as if we sum up our teaching tonight. A benediction from um, Romans 16 here. It says, now to him who is able to strengthen you by my gospel and by the proclamation of, of us, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, according to the revelation of the mystery concealed for ages past, but now revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets by the command of the eternal God in order to lead all nations to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God, be glory forever. Through Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, forever and ever. Amen. You can say amen to that. So um, thank you for, for hearing, hearing me out there. I've certainly enjoyed unpacking those themes. And uh, I'll pass back to Fiona now. And um, if you've perhaps something's come to mind and you've thought of a, a question you'd like to ask or a comment and we'll have a short time of, uh, of q and A, I i think but i'll pass back to fiona now and thank you for listening wow. i'm sure you've all thoroughly enjoyed that